Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2017 Ad Wheel Awards Ceremony. Marta's Senior Director of Marketing and Communications and your MC for this afternoon, Jennifer Ginadu Wright. Hello and good afternoon. It's so great to see you all here. I was a little bit worried when I came in earlier because there was like nobody here, so glad you found us. Um, welcome to... Um, the Adwill Grand Award Ceremony, and welcome to Atlanta, Georgia, which is my adopted, adopted home. I just have just a little bit of a southern draw, but um, I hope that you've really been enjoying your time while you've been here, and that you've been able to experience some of our amazing southern hospitality. But more than the capital of the southeast, Atlanta is ranked one, one of the most charming and friendliest and cultured cities anywhere. Our area is also about economic growth and progress. If you just look outside this convention center, you'll see the evidence of investment from some of the world's largest brands and companies. And if you look even closer, you'll see that so many of the biggest players are choosing to be close to public transit. We have huge organizations such as Coca-Cola, State Farm, and just down the road from here are $1.2 billion new Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Apart from the fact that Mercedes-Benz is a car manufacturer, it's an amazing stadium. And we're so happy that they chose to be right next to one of our major rail stations. So many of us in this room have played a major part in recent years telling the positive transit story where public transportation goes, community grows. Our industry's connection and involvement in growing economies and improving lives has never been stronger. But these stories and the needs of the industries don't just share themselves, and we all know that in this room. The Adwill Grand Award winners have imagined and executed amazing marketing and communication campaigns that have increased ridership, boost sales, won funds for system investments, and earn the public's trust. These communication and marketing successes really show the strategic accomplishments of our organizations and they benefit public transportation as a whole. By sharing these winning lessons with you and with the industry, we can all make public transportation even better than it is today. That's really what the ad wheels are all about. And today we're going to delve deep into the successful strategies behind our 11 grand award winners. And we're also going to have the opportunity to meet with their representatives so that we all can be on this stage this time next year receiving an award. This afternoon, we're going to present grand awards in the following categories. The first category is the campaigns to increase ridership and sales. The second category is the campaigns to highlight transit needs and funding. And the final category is educational campaigns. Before we start to hand out our first awards, let me just explain how our winners were selected. More than 100 industry judges volunteered their time to evaluate over 350 entries. And from these entries, they selected the best submissions from small, medium, and large transit systems based on annual ridership. And then our fourth category is our business owners. Where would we be without our wonderful business members from ACTA? Now, moving on, let's look at our four grand award winners for the best campaign to increase ridership or sales. Let's roll the videos. Located 30 miles east of downtown Cleveland, Lake Tran is a small suburban transit system in Lake County, Ohio. Lake Tran provides local routes, park and ride service to Cleveland, and door-to-door -door dial a ride. With the mass retirement of baby boomers, millennials relocating downtown, plummeting gas prices, and telecommuting, Lake Tran's park and ride ridership saw a steady decline for two straight years. 
To curb this trend, Lake Tran launched Adventures in Commuting. Time now for Adventures in Commuting, episode number 21. Fender Bender turning the highway into a parking lot? Lake Tran keeps you moving. Lake Tran buses can drive on the shoulder when traffic is slow or even stopped, getting you to work on time. Life has enough adventure. Your drive to work shouldn't be one. Leave the adventures in commuting to us. The goal of the ad campaign was to increase awareness and grow ridership by using digital, print, radio, and geo-targeted Facebook and Pandora ads. 67,043 Facebook display impressions with 1,433,822 Pandora display and audio impressions. The total amount of digital impressions reached 1,500,865. With a call to action to sign up for a free ride at laketran.com, the campaign led to 10,353 page views, increasing annual web traffic by 5%. Laketran has 124 new riders using Park and Ride. In 2016, Laketran saw an 8% increase in Park and Ride ridership, and ridership continues to grow with a 6% increase in 2017. Lake Tran continues to tackle the adventures of commuting by making the park and ride experience easy and enjoyable. Recently launching real-time rider tools and a mobile app so riders can track their bus. We're proud to serve Lake County with Park and Ride. We're combating air pollution and sailing past traffic congestion, all while providing a safe, reliable commute for our residents. Thank you for this award. We are honored to be recognized by our transit colleagues and APTA. On to the next adventure. TransLink is the regional transportation authority for Metro Vancouver, Canada's third largest city, serving a population of two and a half million people, located about 140 miles north of Seattle. We're the first North American transportation authority to be responsible for the planning, financing, and managing of all public transit in addition to major regional roads and bridges. In 2016, the first major expansion to our rapid transit SkyTrain system in nearly a decade was launched. A seven-mile, six-station expansion to our Millennium Line, the Evergreen Extension, was added to our existing 42-mile system, giving TransLink and Metro Vancouver the longest fully automated driverless transit system in the world. The Evergreen Extension represented faster, more convenient, and more frequent transit access for customers in the region's fast-growing Northeast sector. The aim of our campaign was to generate awareness and excitement around the Evergreen Extension and use this opportunity to build a positive brand presence for TransLink. Our goal was to maximize the number of people who were aware that the Evergreen Extension was launching on December 2nd and that it was operated by TransLink. We needed a simple, memorable creative platform that could be used across a variety of mediums to reach both the local communities directly impacted and the rest of the region as a whole. The Evergreen Means Go campaign was simple, clever, and flexible. This flexibility allowed us to create a number of executions, communicating multiple benefits in outdoor, digital advertising, newspaper, including ethnic newspaper, transit advertising, radio, video, and printed material. We also had over 100 volunteers, in addition to our frontline staff, to welcome new riders and ensure they had a good experience with the new extension. Evergreen Means Go was a celebration of moving forward moving forward more easily in your day, moving forward more easily as a region, moving forward more easily as a transportation network. The results? The campaign and the launch was a huge success. In the first two months of operation, 150,000 people rode the Evergreen Extension, the equivalent of every person in Coquitlam, one of the largest communities directly served, trying the new service once. Within one month, Weekday boardings on the Evergreen Extension reached 30,000 people. That's fully three times the ridership of the Beeline bus service Evergreen replaced. That meant fewer cars on the road and a better commute for everyone, no matter how they get around. Because Evergreen means go. With breathtaking landscapes, recreation, shopping, dining, nightlife, and forward-thinking industries, the Denver, Colorado metro area is the place to be. Consistently rated as one of the country's best places to live, people worldwide are taking notice. To keep pace with our growing population, RTD continues to forecast the transportation needs of our diverse community, 
creating even more convenient transit options. On April 22, 2016, we continued our transportation transformation, opening the Train to the Plain, the University of Colorado A-Line, connecting downtown Union Station to Denver International Airport. This commuter rail train, a brand new technology for RTD, made our city, our region, and our world a closer, more reachable place. And how did we market such a monumental opening? To mark one of the most anticipated events in Metro Denver's storied transit history, RTD's award-winning in-house marketing team brainstormed and determined that this simple message would be featured with eye-catching graphics, colors, and bold type, emphasizing the line letter designations, destinations, and benefits. Our phased campaign strategy and multimedia tactics would increase awareness, create excitement, and generate ridership among the 2.8 million people we serve locally and many more around the world. And the impact was bigger than even we expected. The Train to the Plane campaign produced staggering results in print, outdoor digital broadcast, on vehicle, and non-traditional media. And these impressions translated to record-breaking crowds at our opening events with more than 80,000 in attendance. News coverage ruled locally, nationally, and internationally. And since opening, ridership has increased to more than 18,000 boardings per day as RTD's Train to the Plane creates a gateway between Denver, the region, and the world. Alstom has been a leader in passenger mobility for more than 100 years, providing subway cars, light rail vehicles, high-speed trains, services, and turnkey solutions. Today, we have more than 2,200 employees across 20 sites and work with hundreds of suppliers across 35 states in the U.S. We're delighted to have been awarded the Amtrak Next Generation High-Speed Train Sets. It's a testament to our more than 35 years of experience selling more than 1,200 Avalia high-speed trains around the world, which have collectively logged 4 billion passenger miles with more than 4 billion passengers having traveled in that time. Alstom's delighted to be recognized for this award. This video is about realizing a dream, the dream of better passenger mobility in the United States. The video takes you through the journey of a passenger starting in Washington Union Station, going through Philadelphia, New York, and the train continuing on to Boston, where you see Amtrak's highly skilled employees working to maintain and service these trains for safe operation each and every day. We've been overwhelmed by the success of the video. Since it was released in August of 2016, we've had almost 4 million views. We, we can't believe the uh, support and excitement that this video has generated about high speed in the US. Together, if we dream it, we can achieve it. We can achieve the goal of better passenger mobility across the United States for everyone. can do better than that. Let's give a big round of applause to all of our winners. Yay. Okay. Before we bring our winners on stage, I'd like to introduce our panel, our panel moderator for this afternoon. He will also help present our grand awards. So join me in welcoming the immediate past chair of the APTA Marketing and Communications Committee and Dallas Area Rapid Transit Vice President of External Relations, and my good friend, Morgan Lyon. <laughs> Joining Morgan to present the Grand Award is a very special guest. We are absolutely delighted to have with us today the Director of Communications and Marketing at TriMet, and APTA's new Marketing and Communications Committee Chair, please welcome JC Vanetta. Thank you, gentlemen. Don't they look cute? Not as cute as me, but they, look, true. they look decent. You wouldn't know what you guys were up to last night. <laughs> okay. Vegas. It's true. <laughs> Right, winners will be asked to come to the stage for a photo. Um, after your photo, the panelists will remain and sit over in our little living room area sure. while the rest of the team can go back to the audience. Okay, our first grand award for the afternoon, chosen from systems with less than four million annual riders. Please join me in welcoming to the stage, 
Lake Tran. Now, for the best campaign to increase ridership from medium-sized systems, let's invite up the next grand award winner, TransLink, the South Coast British Columbia Transportation Authority. Thank you, TransLink. Okay, moving right along, our grand award is for the, the next grand award is for the best campaign to increase ridership by a transit system with more than 20 million annual rides. Please come to the stage, Denver's Regional Transportation District. For the final grand award for the campaign to increase ridership or sales, we have our business group representative. Alston, come on up. Congratulations to the Austin team. Okay, now we have our first panel assembled. We'll turn it over to Morgan. Thank you, Jennifer. Appreciate it. Good afternoon, everyone. That's it? No? Come on. Wake up. The bar's going to open soon. Hi, guys. Congratulations. Thank you. This is cool. So we're going to just a few questions and just kind of chat a little bit about what got you to this stage. Uh, I need to just kind of tell everybody, take lots of notes because the rule in our committee is you can protect your idea until you win an ad wheel. And after that, everybody can steal it. So you'll take a lot of notes. You can download the video. We'll start with you. So you had this thing called Adventures in Commuting. How did that, uh, how'd that come about? Sure, well, we had about 24 months of decline in ridership as a lot of the transit systems that our bus only operation saw in 2014. Um, so we were able to reverse that trend with an 8% ridership growth through a lot of different strategies and upgrades to the system. Um, obviously, the first thing that many people are doing is we were looking at the route alignments. Our downtown Cleveland area is booming. I think we're ready for another APTA conference in Cleveland. And, uh, but part of that meant um, 
people weren't working in the same urban core. It's kind of growing. We have a college that's growing, enrollment's up, and we really needed to look at where we were getting people into downtown Cleveland with our park and ride service. Um, in addition, we launched real-time arrival. We were introducing a brand new fleet, retiring 18-year-old buses, as well as um, a guaranteed ride home program. And then what we thought was most visual, which the campaign was about, was our bus on shoulder program. And I always say, you know, these are our choice riders. And, um, you know, just like any kind of product that you're trying to uh, sell that um, you need to elicit a behavior change is, uh, you know, you need to let them see the pain and that the gain is. And so we purposely did a radio commercial, and that was actually the radio spot that you heard mm -hmm. in the video. So while you're driving your car stuck in traffic in northeastern Ohio, you can't avoid snow, construction, and fender benders. And here is our bus going by in its own little high-speed fast lane along the shoulder. And so I felt we finally had this visual, and that's what Adventures in Commuting was all about. It was telling the car riders that we can, we can combat all those problems that you have getting there. Cool. And with that, like I said, with the campaign, we um, used radio and digital, and we were you know, really happy with an 8% graduate growth. Very good, great. Patricia, you had all kinds of time, right? I'm just kind of going through my notes. You got, you had what, two weeks? Yeah. Something well, like that? Well, we knew when it was launching, but we didn't know the exact date. Yeah. So that, as you can imagine, it's a $2 billion transit investment. So to be going out with a campaign that doesn't tell you exactly when it's launching is a bit of a problem. So once I got over that and realized I did have to run this campaign without an exact date, uh -huh. I was able to be a little bit inventive. So we had to put out across our uh, transit properties launching December 2016, but we were a little bit inventive. When we did the video, when we did the radio, we recorded 30 versions with December 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, so that when we did have an actual date, we could plug it right into our online sources and into the radio. As well, we used the real estate. We had these beautiful stations with a lot of glass. So when we knew that date, we deckled them with 12 feet high decals that said, this train is coming December 2nd. And by the way, it doesn't open start a service. It's at 12 o'clock noon. So we had a lot of complicated messaging. The other thing we did was work really closely with our communications team so that when we knew the date of this was happening, we were able to get it out through all of our media channels, both social and traditional, and just make sure that everybody knew that this was coming. So I think at the end of the day, we managed to get that message out there, and I don't think it impacted ridership. It was more the December and the weather and Christmas time. Yeah, that way you were able to say coming soon or coming in December as opposed to just coming. Coming, dot, dot, dot. The, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. Steve, train to the plane. That's a, that's a good idea. How did you guys uh, come up with that? It, it's so intuitive, but it's also so simple and clear. How'd you guys come up with that? Well, it was actually, I mean, simple and clear. As we sat down and, and really looked at what the train was going to mean for all of our communities, we really were entranced by the fact that everyone had such a tremendous excitement and enthusiasm about it and we really need to deliver on that expectation and promise so as we started thinking through it and what the advantages would be uh, you know we thought about the convenience aspects we thought about the international connections and access which was a huge one for us and we really knew that we needed to come up with something that was very simple but tremendously impacting and so as we started to think about all the, the connectivity and the fact that we were talking about two modes of transportation, we just came up with this very, just kind of hit us, this very rhythmic, uh, memorable phrase, train to the plane, that just kind of said it all. And uh, the minute we were sitting down in our brainstorming sessions and, and we were just collaborating and, and thinking about out loud about all these different words that might comprise this phrase, those were the, the words that really just stuck and really just say it, said it all in just a very few words and we got it out there in so many different avenues and it was just so tremendously well accepted the community was just so excited about it really got behind it the media got behind it everyone started utilizing that phrase and so it was really just something that stuck and we were able to build a just a huge campaign around that you know using some very impacting graphics using some uh, you know, modern typography, color palettes, and, and really taking those two forms of transportation, both uh, 
you know, with an adventurous sense to them and putting them out there because anytime you go on a trip somewhere, you know, it's always some sort of sense of adventure, whether you're on a train or an airplane or another mode of transportation. We really wanted to just capitalize on that feeling. And so we, we were really able to do that effectively and it just worked out tremendously well for us. And if I remember, that's one of a series of, of service launches you had in a fairly compressed time. That's correct. We did have several service launches within basically a 24 month period. We opened a BRT service. We opened the Train to the Plane University of Colorado A-Line. We opened our R-Line. Um, we've uh, launched our new mall shuttle vehicles. We just had a lot going on at our system, and, and that was definitely one of, the, one of the larger endeavors that we had done. So we kind of planned for this all in, in a compressed time frame within that 24 months. Great, thanks. Scott, as I understand, uh, the video was produced, the, your, your award-winning video was produced after you'd won the business. Is that, it seems a little counterintuitive there. Yeah, no, that's, that's right. It was, uh, it, it was launched to support the, uh, the, the rollout and the, and the start of the project. Now, how long, uh, how far before the, the vehicles are actually delivered, and, and what was the thinking behind, uh, you get the business, do the video, and then the trains come. What was your thinking behind that from a communication standpoint? Sure, so when we won this contract, it was, uh, we, we were really quite excited about it and, and Amtrak was really quite excited to be able to be getting the trains that were gonna help meet the need for their service. But we, we both recognize that uh, we were benefiting from public funds, right? The, the, the public is, is making this investment. And it was a unique opportunity to really capture the administration or the imagination of America to, to let them see what rail transportation can be and what the next generation of mobility can be in the United States. And, you know, it's not every day that high-speed trains are sold in the U.S. It's not every day you're able to have such a highly visible uh, procurement to capture people's imagination and get them to dream a little bit about what, uh, what rail can mean for this country and what it can mean for, for mobility. So to support our customer, to support the discussion in America about the importance of rail and the benefit that it brings to us all, uh, we, we, with our partner Amtrak, our customer Amtrak, uh, set forth uh, in the creation of this video to, to help people dream about what can be. Cool, thank you. Julia, one of the things that it, it seems like everybody's got a comprehensive operations analysis or route restructure or whatever, how did you guys go about kind of setting the priority of the features? Because you talked about some of those in your initial answer. How did you kind of know what the, the pain points were? Sure, well, like I also mentioned that we wanted Bus on Shuttle had a very visual image to the community of what we're doing. You know, we can tell you you're gonna save money on gas, but when gas was almost dipping below $2 a gallon, that's not quite the case. This is a visual that people could see when they're stuck in traffic, that there's a bus going by 35 miles an hour on the side of the road. So we really wanted to focus on the bus on shoulder when we first delivered that. Um, outside of that, we also used a lot of signage, which I didn't really mention. It was a little outside of our uh, bus on children, our adventures in commuting, but prior to the launch of the route realignments, we didn't actually even have bus stop signs in downtown Cleveland, which is where we're a, we're a suburban community about 30 miles east of downtown Cleveland. And with the real-time arrival that we were launching, it gave an opportunity for us to really create a wayfinding and some identity in downtown Cleveland that we never had before. Okay, great. Patricia, one of the challenges you have is, is that you cover a lar pretty large geographic area but this service is, is fairly uh, limited. It's, it's not a, a, a really long line, so the, but the, the true or the clear or obvious benefits within that area. How did you go about explaining that regional benefit? And did that come up into the messaging at all? Absolutely, so prior to the launch of the Evergreen Extension, we'd had zero expansion for almost a decade. So we didn't have a lot of good news stories. We're always in the media on a negative front, so this, signaled a new day for TransLink. So we wanted to use every opportunity to tell the region um, about what we were bringing. So we didn't just focus, we focused on the riders and the potential ridership, but use the opportunity to talk to the region about opening up a, a new sector, a new place for them to be connected to, and remind them of all the benefits of rapid transit that was coming. Uh, don't waste any chance to be able to tell the public about what we're bringing to them with, with transit. Very cool, mm -hmm. thanks. Steve, you guys pulled out all the tricks, or all the stops. What, uh, what worked particularly well, 
and, and I guess kind of as a follow-up, were, were there any surprises about, you thought, man, this is going to work. I've got a killer fill-in-the-blank ad piece of, and it just went. <laughs> well, the good news is that uh, pretty much everything worked in okay. one way or another. I mean, we had such a wide-ranging multimedia mix, and one of the things that definitely helped us was and we had a digital call to action tied to every single thing that we did. So either it was to our URL, rtd-semmer.com slash train to the plane or our hashtag train to the plane. And we encouraged use and sharing of that as much as we possibly could. And uh, we, you know, we did a lot of traditional things. We did a lot of print. We did a lot of environmental, a lot of on vehicle things. Um, our direct mail was just tremendously successful. We pulled a 20% response rate on our direct mails on about 150,000 pieces of mail. Um, and the great thing about that was the direct mail was actually intended to invite people to our grand openings and parties. And the secondary response was this rede redemption offer for free rides, and that's where we were able to pull 20%. A couple of other really fun and, and interesting out-of-the-box things that we did was we just we put it out there everywhere. We were in uh, you know, sports, the sports arenas and the concert venues with just all different sorts of digital advertising. We wrapped a Zamboni at the Avalanche hockey game and people got to ride it. That turned out to be a really fun type event thing. And, uh, you know, we were just really out there in as many avenues as we possibly could, um, just getting the word out. And the other really fun thing that we did that we had never done before was uh, we, we had a social media contest for, it was called Stay or Go, and we were uh, giving away uh, tickets to either stay in Denver and ride the train, stay downtown, go see Peter Gabriel and Sting, or go to Chicago and fly and see Beyonce. So we had about 50,000 entries into that contest. It really opened us up to a whole new avenue. And so we just really knew that, that there was just so much interest out there. We had to get out of as many areas as we possibly could. So we were just really pleased with the results. Great. Scott, let me give you the last question. I think in the introductory video, you talked about, what, 4.6 million views of the video. Surprised? And have you ever had anything like that? O overwhelming. Never, never expected to have that kind of response to the video. What do you think the, what was the key, you think? I mean, people love trains. We see that, you know, you put a train picture out. And the, 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 they do. The, the the thing that I think really helped the video is it. it I think it spoke to the passenger. You, you know, we lots of companies make trains, right? And uh, the technology is neat, but it's really about the passenger experience. And th the video really is a blend of industrial design and the beauty that you can have in a train, as well as the passenger experience and the journey and the amenities that are available to them and the comfort and just the quality of experience you can have getting from point A to point B. Look, we, we all suffer, and I, and I love the, uh, the video that you had in uh, northeastern Ohio where, you know, we're happy in our homes, we're somewhat comfortable at work, but we all suffer in our commutes. Transportation is largely miserable and a miserable experience. And this video was really to evoke, you know, how we can get around, how we can be mobile in this country and have a positive, pleasurable experience. And I think people will really respond to that and, and saw that in the video. Terrific. Thank you, panel. Join me in thanking our panel. Congratulations. Jennifer. Thank you, panel. Now we will recognize three grand award winners for the best campaign to highlight transit needs and funding. So let's look at the next set of videos and have a look at their work. Operated by NAPTA, the Northern Arizona Intergovernmental Public Transportation Authority, Mountain Line has been a model of excellence since it launched in 2001. Ridership has grown tenfold. Per passenger costs have been cut in half. Routes have been added, and the fleet is 100% hybrid electric. Since the agency's last tax authorization in 2008, NAPTA has been committed to delivering on the promises made to voters. With that tax due to sunset, NAPTA took the temperature of local voters before pursuing a renewal. Although 86% supported a flat tax renewal, the 2016 ballot was already crowded with a tense national election and contentious state and local initiatives. But Proposition 411 was placed on the local ballot to ask voters to renew the existing transit tax for 10 years. Proposition 411 was not an obligation, it was actually an opportunity for NAPTA to tell our story, 
how we kept our promises to the voters, and how we have been very effective and efficient with the taxpayer dollar. Strong communication and marketing were the pillars of the campaign, which had two primary strategies. First, to make clear that Prop 411 was the continuation of an existing tax, not a new tax. Second, to show voters that NAPTA is a good steward of tax dollars and has delivered on everything promised in 2008. The heart of the campaign was a series of five open houses and 40 community meetings that gave NAPTA the chance to address voters and community leaders' questions head on. Combined with a comprehensive communications and marketing plan, the Prop 411 campaign reached a significant percentage of Flagstaff voters. Maintaining community trust has been very important to NAPTA over the 10 years we've existed. And that trust is demonstrated in the 71% support we received on Proposition 411. During an unpredictable election season, having a consistent and strong message was key. And thanks to the success of the Prop 411 campaign, Mountain Line will continue serving Flagstaff. Heart in West Central Florida created a video to highlight the importance of innovative public-private partnerships in our community. The Beyond the Bus video is short, concise, and dynamic designed to help state and federal decision makers understand that Hart is forward thinking and progressive, even while balancing low per capita funding. Our video was filmed with drones and highlights all the innovations Hart has accomplished through partnerships. Take a look for yourself at our Beyond the Bus video. Transportation is key to regional economic development. And when comparing Tampa's per capita spending in transit between Atlanta, Dallas, Charlotte, and Jacksonville, we do more. Hillsboro Area Regional Transit Authority services approximately 1,000 square miles, nearly the size of Rhode Island. We drive over 9 million miles per year. That's 19 round trips to the moon. And we've created countless innovations along the way, such as Flamingo Fairs, Hyperlink, the nation's first to offer transit-operated rideshare service, and One Bus Away, providing real-time departure info with native apps and a dynamic planning feature. Hart was even first in Florida to push live data into the Google Trip Planner. To improve our environmental footprint, our entire fleet is transitioning to compressed natural gas. And we're ISO certified in environmental sustainability. HART is also leading efforts to advance transportation options and public-private partnerships. We are committed to improving our transit efforts for our riders, Hillsborough County, and the planet. Join us, and together, let's go beyond the bus. The communications team for Metro was integral and central to the messaging to the public for Measure M. We were very thoughtful about how we put our communications program together to try to find ways that we could reach people in the ways that they want to be communicated to. We were trying to capture the heart and soul of voters and the community. We would not have been able to pass this measure without the communications team. A lot of what we did in our messaging came from the people. We listened to what the people told us through our public opinion surveys, through our focus groups, and also through some social media efforts. We took that as our lead on how to develop our messaging platform. We did a whole robust public information campaign through traditional and non-traditional methods, the things that you typically do, the public meetings, the information guides, but we did telephone town hall meetings. Social media was huge for us, where we had like 81 million impressions. So we had done this very robust public education program, doing all the things that you typically do, but then some things that were different and unique and fun. We had pretty much done everything that we could to educate the public. So we decided, you know what, we're just gonna have some fun. And so we did a bunch of pop-up events where we had entertainment, we had people out there handing out information and M&Ms. 
M&Ms or Measure M and just reminding people to weigh in and to vote. We also had a transit flash mob that would be at our pop-up events at some of our busiest stations. So the mayor of LA, Mayor Eric Garcetti, he even got in on the fun and he even danced with the flash mobbers. Every one of these campaigns really has to have a political champion. And we had Mayor Eric Garcetti. He really was the face of the campaign and he was out there in force. And his bold leadership and the bold leadership of our CEO, Philip Washington, our board chair, John Fasana, and all of our Metro board, that was significant in them leading the way. This really was a landmark program that we put together here in LA County. It's a model for a transit initiative. It came from the people, for the people, and ultimately the people decided that they wanted Measure M and a transformation of transportation. Weren't those fantastic examples of campaigns to highlight transit needs and funding? Um, let's have Morgan and JC return to present the next three awards. Welcome back, gentlemen. Now, please join me in welcoming to the stage this category's first grand award winner, representing systems with less than 4 million annual riders, Northern Arizona Intergovernmental Public Transportation Authority. Thank you, Nate. Next, in the median size system group, we bring up this year's winner to highlight transit needs and funding, the Hillsborough Area Regional Transit Authority. Another round of applause for Hart. <laughs> Finally, we have the largest systems grand award for the best campaign to highlight transit needs and funding. And the grand award goes to Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authority. Congratulations to everyone at LA Metro. Okay. All right, Morgan, handing back to you for the next panel. All right, thank you, Jennifer. Hey, guys. Nice job. Congratulations. So, Jackie, let me start with you. I love the name Mountain Light. I think that's, that's kind of cool. You did some early polling. You found a lot of... Uh, support. I mean, in some senses, what, 86% support on the front end. So why bother? Why not just kind of, in this environment, why raise your head up there and let somebody take a snap at it? 
Well, I think if the uh, 2016 election taught us anything, it's that polls cannot necessarily be trusted. Shocking. <laughs> so uh, we definitely didn't want to take anything for granted. And we saw it as an opportunity to really connect with our riders and nine riders and do an educational campaign. We opted to not work with a PAC. We handled it all in-house. So it really was about education, not about persuasion. And we were also in the midst of a really crowded ballot. And people have short memories. So you had the national election. In Arizona, we had marijuana legalization. We had minimum wage. Locally, we had a mayoral race and another minimum wage question. So we really just wanted to do an educational campaign to make sure that transit stayed top of mind for everyone. OK, great. Steve, let me, I want to ask you a little bit. But first, you guys have been in the big middle of all the hurricane stuff. How are you guys doing? I'd be remiss if I didn't ask that. Um, I've been in transit for seven years now, and we have hurricane uh, drills every year. This is the first time we actually close down and service the people. Um, it was scary. Yeah. Um, we dodged the bullet. We were very lucky. Um, but it, it was a lot of work. It was a lot of work. So let's talk about something fun. Okay. This award. The, the video really uh, talks about a, a lower per capita level of spending. How, do, how did that translate with, uh, how, how did your other governmental partners kind of receive that message? Boy, is that a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when I got that question, I was like, I could go either way on yeah. it. Um, so I'm gonna take the safe way. Uh, they know we're very underfunded. Um, one thing that we are very good at is um, getting private partnerships and funding for that, and through our private-public pu partnerships, um, we're doing a lot of firsts in the nation. Um, we are gonna have an autonomous vehicle running downtown in the fall. Um, hard hyperlink, we've had a partnership with Tesla Motors to bring out electric vehicles, which was funded mostly by our local electric company. Um, these are even newer things that were even in the um, video. Paulette, I don't think a lot of folks realize that, that California properties have a little higher threshold. It's not enough to win with 50% plus one vote. You guys have to have, what, three quarters, two thirds, something? Yeah, so what, uh, what kind of promises did you make, credible promises, and, and I just wanna know, where are the M&Ms? Wait, yeah, we should. We still actually have some left. We should have brought them with. Yeah, us. really. We could have taken care of that. So, what were the promises that worked? And and yeah, I am kind of curious about how many M and M's you gave out. So, uh, we do have a two-thirds threshold in California, and so we had to get like 66.67 percent of the vote. All things told, we ended up with over 71 percent of the vote. And as far as the promises, I mean. Uh, our team, our whole Metro team, led by our CEO, Phil, and our board, um, it was really all about going to the people through a bottom-up process and them helping us craft this whole program and them having skin in the game from the very beginning. So that process that was transparent and open across the whole county of LA was significant and the coalition building was also very important. And I think because of that, we were able to really get to a lot of stakeholders and audiences because we had so many people who felt they were a part of this from the beginning. From the communications end, we really piggybacked on that and we went to the people for how to craft our messaging platform. And we used uh, a unique way through social media where we actually uh, put some phrases and some words, some phraseology out there and ask people how they felt about it. And what, what really resonated with them is what helped us uh, with our whole communications messaging platform for Measure M. And as far as the M&Ms go, we gave out something like, I mean, so many tens of thousands of M&Ms. Uh, it was like thousands of pounds of M&Ms. And that was just kind of one of those fun things that we did to connect with the people because this was really for the people from the people and the people decided and, um, you know, we tried to interject some fun in that. Cool, good job. Jackie, one of the things with, you know, we'd, we'd like to think when we do transit elections that having our own riders vote is enough, but we know that that's not the case. 
What did you do to, uh, to help convince non-riders that this was, there was value to them and that they needed to get to the polls and work through, as you described, a really, I mean, I think I'd go to sleep with the ballots you described. How, how did you guys convince the non-voters? The public outreach portion of our campaign was really the hallmark of what we did. Our team, our CEO, our assistant general manager, several other staff members attended more than 40 public meetings. So we're talking business groups, chamber, uh, community groups, and by the, by the end of it, I would look out in the audience and yeah, I think you all have seen this one before. But that was the point, is to really get to them. These are mostly our non-writers. And we just really wanted to drive that message home. And our message was, this is a continuation. We wanted there to be no doubt that this was an increase. This is not an increase, this is a continuation. And so we really drove that message home. And then we also drove home the message of promises made, promises kept. The last time we went to voters in 2008, they very kindly uh, gave a, passed five propositions. And then we promptly hit a recession. And we were able to follow through on all five of those. And so, short-term memory, they all forgot about that, and we reminded them. That was a huge part of what we did. Remember, you trusted us with this. We delivered. You can continue to trust us. And that was really the message that we wanted to drive home uh, to those who may not ride with us every day. Okay, great. Steve, I want to spend a couple of minutes on, your, on the tagline about beyond the bus, the hashtag beyond the bus. What... Uh, Describe that. What is that? How, how does that play out? It seems like you go a lot of ways with that. Where are you guys finding kind of the sweet spot with that? I, I'm very lucky that I work for a visionary leader, Catherine Egan, shameless plug, job security. I'll call her. Catherine. Yes. You know Catherine. And um, very visionary, wants to be innovative, the first in whatever we do. Um, we were known as an old bus company that had a problem with our streetcar. And what we wanted to do is change perception of who we are and the people that work here. So going beyond the bus talks about all of our public-private partnerships. It talks about how we were first with Google Trip Planner um, and then Hyperlink again, Tesla Motors, um, which has never been done before. And um, just going beyond the bus, it's the people behind it. And what we needed to really do is change the image, and it's working and she's a dynamic leader, and she's the right person to do it. Great. Tell her hello. I, I think you guys have a service change going on. Actually, uh, today, today is the second day yeah. of our comprehensive overhaul of the system. And um, I got lucky. I got to come here rather than be out in the um, operations area at 3 o'clock in the morning when the bus is pulled. Because nothing so, goes wrong um, on service. This changes. is definitely yeah. much better. Thank All you. Right. Congratulations. Pauletta, we. You know, one of the things you said in the entry is that you hoped that, that, that your award, your, your winning, would kind of inspire folks to think and try. Because, again, you, you have an unusually high threshold. Uh, I talked earlier about we're all about stealing the ideas. So what's the best idea from, from this campaign that we need to steal? Well, there's actually a, a couple. So we, our whole messaging was... Um, showcase as much progress as possible in what you're delivering through the investment that people are already making. So that was significant, but we still have more to do. The other thing was social media, because I mentioned that we use social media on the front end to help us develop our messaging platform, but then we also utilized social media through the analytics and what we know about people behind the scenes of social media to target messages specific to them based on uh, demographics or geographic area on what Measure M was going to deliver for them in their communities. The projects, um, bike, bicycle and pedestrian pathways, whatever was relevant to their particular area and to them personally in what we learn about them. And so that was really important. And I think also telephone town hall meetings is a way to reach thousands of people in one one hour telephone meeting versus holding a public meeting and you might get 20, 50, 80 people at a meeting. And so we did a round of those for each of our board member areas and we collectively were able to reach about 50,000 people uh, who stayed on the line with us for anywhere from a few minutes to the full hour. And at least they knew something more about Metro and Measure M than they did before. Any surprises from all of that? I mean, you guys tried so many different things. Is there, and it's similar to the question that I asked Steve earlier, was there something that just worked, you know, whoa, I didn't think it would work that well, or I know this is gonna work and it just, no. 
Well, that's a really good question. So I would say that what, what it's a did go win, well was, were the telephone town hall meetings. I'm not sure we had anything that didn't go well, but one quick story was the mailer that never became a mailer. And we did this beautiful fold-out piece that showed uh, what the system would look like with all the new highway projects and new transit projects. And it had gone through numerous iterations. And we were literally ready to go to print. We had somebody at the printer uh, doing a proof check and such. And we had to pull it because we had some concerns, namely from our legal folks, who basically were worried that it was going to look too much like campaigning. And we didn't want to look like we were being the campaign team. Um, and because we never mail stuff to all residents in LA County, they were very concerned about that. One lesson learned for us, however, is we need to remember that our legal folks are there to give us legal advice, but sometimes you have to make bold decisions. And we did print it, we didn't mail it, but we got it out through our various stakeholders and um, that was at least a way we could distribute it. But I would say about bold leadership from the top down, from Phil Washington, from our, our board chair, from Mayor Garcetti, the board, and all of us who worked to develop Measure M and communicate about it. Being bold is significant, and sometimes that's a risk, and yet when you do it, um, I think you show a different fabric of what you're willing to do, and I think people rally around the fact that you're just even bold. Great, what a great discussion. Thank you guys, congratulations again. Join me in congratulating these guys. Jennifer. Thank you guys, great job. Thank you, panel. Thank you, Morgan. Now for our final category, we will present four grand awards for the best education campaign. Let's look at the videos for these at will winners. Welcome to Blacksburg, Virginia, home of Virginia Tech, the Blue Ridge Mountains, and Blacksburg Transit. The population of Blacksburg is growing rapidly, and so are the demands for increased service. In 2016, we were struggling to hire enough bus operators and struggling to meet the needs of the community. At the same time, the print-based employment ads that we had previously relied on were no longer bringing in enough applicants. We needed a change, and we needed it fast. We switched gears, dumped print ads, and went the digital route, launching our Drive for BT advertising campaign. Here, we identified three separate age groups and focused our advertising efforts on social media. We developed targeted creative for young adults, 18 to 24 year olds, second jobbers, 25 to 50 year olds, and retirees, 50 and above. These ads led to newly created landing pages specialized for each group. We were blown away by the response. Applications were flying in, and for once, we were able to measure our success, thanks to the available analytics. Our objective was to bring in 200 applications over a 12-month period. We did that in just five months, with a 22% increase in staffing in the first three months. By updating our marketing efforts, we were able to hire enough operators and be the reliable transit system once again. Metrolink has introduced the mobile ticketing app to Southern California, making purchasing tickets easier and more convenient for their passengers. Metrolink's target audience consists of weekday commuters and recreational riders. A campaign was created in an effort to shift riders from purchasing tickets through the ticket vending machine to using the Metrolink app, saving time and money for their customers. The objectives of the campaign were to raise awareness and increase sales through the mobile app, improve perception, and provide ticketing options that younger generations have come to expect. Campaign tactics included floor decals placed in front of the ticket vending machines, a video to help familiarize riders with the app, brand ambassadors on the trains to promote the app, posters displayed at Metrolink stations, rack cards distributed to passengers, digital and social communications, and a pop-up banner displaying the app listing on the user's phone. Results for the first six months were impressive, with 18% of all passengers purchasing tickets through the app. 
which was 225% above the projected goal. And over the course of eight months, the percentage of passengers purchasing tickets through the app increased from 9% to 25%. And right on track, Metrolink continued to see increases in sales and transactions every month during the course of the campaign. In the first six months following its release, the app had over 200,000 downloads and transactions and over $4 million in sales. As the second busiest transportation provider in Southern California, Metrolink will continue its ongoing efforts to promote the benefits of using the mobile ticketing app. A division of Metrolinx, Go Transit is the regional public transit service in southern Ontario. Connecting over 250,000 daily commuters in the greater Toronto area and the surrounding communities. But poor etiquette on board buses and trains was resulting in higher than normal customer complaints. We had to improve overall etiquette for everyone. We knew from the past that a traditional PSA campaign approach would just get ignored. So we turned to social, and researching our target's digital habits led us to our key insight. People love to complain on social media. So we decided to turn their etiquette-related frustrations into our campaign. First, we created the etiquette fail hashtag and invited our riders to vent their frustrations. Then we took their complaints and turned them into our ads overnight. We created animated GIFs, transit posters, and etiquette pamphlets, all based on actual customer complaints, and made a video highlighting the top five etiquette fails. Within days of launch, etiquette fail became a national topic of conversation. Well, Go Transit is launching a new campaign aimed at making riders a little more considerate. We gained over six million impressions on Twitter and Facebook, and over one million engagements. With a small budget of only $30,000, we gained $2 million of earned media. That's a media lift of over 5,600%. In only two months, etiquette fails in the five key areas were down by 36%, and customer complaints decreased by 80% across the board, making Go Transit more enjoyable for everyone. Siemens solutions have transformed the way people work, learn, and travel throughout the last century. At Siemens, we create ingenuity for life. And while it may be our new brand claim, it's been in our DNA from the beginning. In early 2016, we set out to tell the story of what ingenuity for life means through the eyes of our customers. And the long-standing relationship with TriMet in Portland, Oregon, was the perfect way to share the impact Siemens Intelligent Transportation Solutions have on the city. Siemens delivered 18 custom S70s for TriMet with a goal of creating light rail vehicles riders would embrace. To do this, TriMet surveyed commuters who requested space for bikes, wheelchairs, and guitars. And since the people of Portland were the focus from the start, we showcased their stories. Everyone thought I was crazy to open a hotel here. Everyone said it's so hard to be a musician, but I can't imagine doing anything else. Now that the train makes it easier to get here, the neighborhood is really changing. The Ingenuity for Life campaign launched in 2016 and includes videos, print ads, websites, and social media. With each medium, we compared the stories of businesses and people side by side to show the impact of Siemens technology. Initial reports show 55% awareness for our Ingenuity for Life campaign with an 88% likability factor. And when it comes to traffic, the Siemens Intelligent Transportation webpage has seen its fair share with more than 19,000 visits during the first six months. These are mostly from paid search and Google display networks with a conversion rate of 13%. By telling our story through the experiences of those who use our technology each and every day, we make real what matters. What great work we just saw. Okay, let's welcome back Morgan and JC.
So we'll bring up our first awardee in the educational campaign category, representing systems with fewer than 4 million annual riders. Come on up, Blacksburg Transit for your well-deserved grand award. <laughs> Thank you, Blacksburg Transit. The second grant award in the educational campaign category goes to Southern California Regional Rail Authority, Metrolink. Congratulations, Metrolink. The next transit system to receive a 2017 Adwill Grand Award represents the largest agencies with over 20 million annual riders. And the winner is Go Transit. Done, go transit. The final grand award for an educational campaign goes to an APTA business member. Please help me recognize Siemens. Congratulations to Siemens and all the grand award winners in the educational campaign category. Back to you, Morgan, for the final panel. Thank you, Jennifer. Congratulations, guys. Great work. That's cool. Farron, let's start with you. Uh, social media was a big part, or was really the part of this recruiting campaign. Uh, how did you come to choose social media and, and what, uh, you know, one of the great things about social media, I guess, is it gives us lots of data. So how did that roll into to your thinking here? So for the first time ever, we were able to view detailed demographics of those who are, our ads were reaching, unlike print where we knew nothing at all. Um, so from that information, we were able to then target our efforts on those that were likely to act or that were seeing the best results from our ads. Um, also, it helped that we could, you know, in-house have the copy, the creative, and our own budget just tweaked whenever we needed to if things were looking wrong um, or if they were looking right, keep them the same. So we brought in more applicants because of social media, but also we brought in more of the right applicants, those that we knew were likely to end up applying for the job besides just clicking on the ad. Okay, cool. William, a lot of people are looking at, at uh, app-based systems. Uh, there's an app for everything, like even APTA, right? But not everybody has a smartphone. So how did you, uh, how'd you kind of target the different audiences so that you could not only take advantage of the folks 
who had the smartphones, but also make sure that folks who didn't have it weren't left feeling they had this 18th, 19th century technology? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and you're right, not everyone has a smartphone, but you know, we're, we're seeing that, that this trend is changing. You know, the world is changing at large, and uh, you know, us as a, a transit agency in Southern California, we, we had to identify that and, and, and really change with it. Um, you know, one of the things that we did was when we were creating this app, we developed it in a way um, to be used on the most amount of platforms. You know, we identified iOS, with it, which is Apple, and the, uh, the Google Android platform as, as being used in the most amount of the marketplace. So we um, ultimately developed the app for that, um, and then we, we then used tactics to teach people how to use this app. So for those uh, riders that weren't as familiar with technology, we rode the train, we had a street team that would actually go out and teach people how to download the app, how to use the app and interact with Metrolink. Um, for other users that are, were more tech savvy, we engaged with them on, on Facebook, on Twitter. Uh, we seeded the conversation and we ultimately um, explained that Metrolink now has an app that you can buy your tickets. Um, finally, what we did was we engaged with people that had experienced our ticket vending machines in the past and, and didn't have a, a pleasant experience. You know, they wrote in, they complained. Um, you know, we used email marketing with them and we let them know, we now have a solution for you um, that could overcome some of the challenges you faced in the past. Okay. Jessalyn, in, in Toronto, uh, everybody wants to be friendly and have comfortable rides, but your research found, what was it? 96% had run into, you know, Mr. Smelly Foot Guy or somebody decided curry was excellent today on the train. What, what was your reaction? I mean, were you surprised at that number? I mean, it's just like, whoa. It would have been surprising other than we were seeing it year after year. So it wasn't like it was just a one-year anomaly that 96% of our customers were saying that they loved the experience of being on the GO trains, but it was the actual the other customers that were bothering them. And uh, at GO Transit, we have a passenger charter uh, that has five commitments, and one of them is to make it a comfortable trip. So it was, what are we going to do? How do we speak on behalf of the customers who are, we're very polite in Canada, so we tend not to want to say anything to each other. So how do we give our customers a voice? And uh, saying that etiquette fails, uh, that, you know, putting all your books on the seat and, you know, walking around clipping your nails is really not appropriate action on the, on the transit. And uh, it just, it blew our minds how quickly it took off. Um, customers were so excited to have a voice and to be able to not just retweet, but you know, go out and uh, take pictures, um, say, I'm on this train at this time and this person's doing this. Um, they were just going crazy on it. And like I say, social media went big on it, but even our traditional media, as you saw in the video, uh, they were all taking the story as well because the fact is we'd all experienced it. And it was just finally nice to have someone who would give us a voice. Okay. Mary Beth, in, is it Ingenuity for Life is the brand, brand promise, the brand claim. How does, the, how does this video really reinforce that and, and this campaign? How does that kind of bring the brand promise to life? Well, uh, I think it helps us to reshape the way people think about Siemens. So we're a 170 year old company so most people know us for financial strength and dependability and quality engineering, but they don't necessarily know that we invest a billion dollars a year in the U.S. on research and development, especially in digital technologies and electrification and automation. So this campaign really gave us the ability to showcase some of the really cool, innovative work and industry firsts that we're partnering on with our customers. And I think um, you saw TriMet featured in this particular one. Um, we have worked with TriMet on a number of innovations, and a number were mentioned, so I won't cover them again, but passenger comfort and all of that. But we also worked with TriMet um, to pilot the first ener regenerative energy uh, storage unit in the U.S. to sustainably power the line. So we are very grateful that we had a partner that was willing to be so innovative, and we were grateful that uh, TriMet allowed us to tell our story. Great, thank you. Farron, I'm guessing that uh, you're now on the uh, Human Resources Manager's Christmas card list. Oh, yeah. 
and fruit baskets and all that good stuff. How, how did that how did that success change the way communications was viewed as a strategic initiative within your organization? So we all know marketing has always been a vital part of our organization, but people were very skeptical of digital marketing, social media marketing. Um, so we helped to change that. And as well, I mean, our results speak for themselves from our campaign, but really and truly what changed for us is now our whole organization is benefiting from digital marketing. So what was just an operator recruitment program is now a staff recruitment program. HR is all in, all positions we have, we are now doing a social media push for everything. Um, and it also carries over to all of our promotional efforts and campaigns in general. Um, so changed our marketing program a lot. Great, congratulations. William, how did, you, uh, how did you convince folks to move from those ticket vending machines to this new approach? What was the carrot? Yeah, yeah, so you know, um, as I kind of alluded to earlier, you know, the customer, they, they want that mobile experience. You know, they, they, the smartphone is controlling all of our lives now. I mean, really, you wake up and that's the first thing you check. Um, and, th and that's where we needed to be. You know, we needed to be where our customer was at and provide that level of service for what they were expecting. Um, you know, just, just to give you some uh, context with where our system was at, back in 2011, you know, we had 90% of all of our users come to our website on a desktop computer. You fast forward to today, uh, we have 80% of all web traffic is now from a smartphone. And you know, that's not even including tablets or any other means. So you know, we had to be there where our customers were at because that's what they were expecting of us uh, as they rode the train. Um, so that's, that's really why we did that. That was the care, was the convenience factor for them that they could ultimately not have to worry about getting to the station 15 minutes early to, to go try to wait in line and buy a ticket. Now they can ultimately do that and, and they have the control in the palm of their hand. Great. Jesslyn, one of the things that the, uh, that the video, the introductory video talks about and that the judges were particularly impressed with was the return on investment from you spent, I think, $30,000 and got trillion dollars or whatever in return. Talk, let's talk a little bit about the return on investment and, and how you kind of uh, plan through that and think through that and, and how does that play into your future plans? So I think like everyone, we're starting to really recognize the power of social media when it comes to these types of campaigns. Um, it's all about being able to find that fun little checkpoint, something that is going to grab uh, the social, uh, social media world. Um, you know, like say under $50,000, uh, we wound up not even spending all of our budget. Uh, it turned into over half a million favorable posts on Facebook, over 800,000 on Twitter. And what's really been great is it's a year later since we launched the campaign, it's still on Twitter. I was actually looking at some, uh, some comments this morning um, and it's still out there. And it's not even the social media, it's even just on the train. People are talking about it. Um, and that return on that very small investment of really just some marketing on some cartoons, uh, it just took us, uh, took us all the way. We work really closely with our customers, as the video talked about, to get their input. And uh, the committee just was all crazy for this. And uh, we were expecting a nice little uptick. And instead, we've really changed the, the customer experience on those trains. That's great. So I, I've got to ask. Is the uh, the guy that was doing the the leg squats or whatever? Is that? I mean, I can imagine that's a real thing operating in our environment, or is that totally made up? It, it is real, and it's what I find is interesting. I'm actually relatively new to transit. I've only been in in the industry a few years. It's amazing talking to customers, including myself. People don't realize that they're doing it. You know, they're just you know taking off their shoes and they're just stretching their legs. And the next thing they know, they're putting their feet on the seats. And uh, it's until someone can point it out to them. Do you realize that's where I'm going to sit? Do you realize that's where my child may have her hands? That people actually change their behavior. Okay, that's great. That it doesn't surprise me that that was a real <laughs> deal. Mary Beth, let me give you the last question, and I want to pick up on something you said. You mentioned you mentioned TriMet, a and let's talk a little bit about how a, a public transit partner really helps you bring this innovation, this I'm sorry, in ingenuity for life, kind of to the fore. How does public transit really fit into that brand promise? Well, I think that. 
people, I think we all know this, people are very um, personally and emotionally connected to transit. I mean, that's, that's how they live. That's how they get to work. That's how they get around the city. And so it's a great vehicle. And I think that there's more innovation now in transit and transportation than there ever has been before. I mean, if you look around even at the digital revolution that's going on right now, we work with more and more customers every day to show how data applications and analytics can help people better manage operations and even predict maintenance issues. We're working on e-buses and e-highways and connected vehicle technologies. We're working with the city of Seattle on how better data management can help improve traffic flow downtown. You know, we. There are 3D scanning for accident repairs and train control systems for light rail vehicles. I mean, the list literally goes on and on. So I think this is the perfect venue um, for the Ingenuity for Life campaign, and I think it's the best time to be in transit. Great. Thank you very much. Great discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in thanking our panel. You now have 11 great ideas to steal. Go. And we'll look to see you guys up here next year. Thank you very much. Jennifer? Thank you. Thank you so much, Morgan, for moderating today. Um, and also, before you go off the stage, just all your years of all the work that you've done to help elevate marketing and communicators, you really do appreciate it. Thank you. And also a special thank you and a welcome to JC, our new committee chair, who's backstage. We'll just clap for him anyway. So I know I learned a lot from the 11 Grand Award winners, and I hope that you did too. And the one thing that they've all demonstrated is that there really is a strategic importance behind marketing and communications. And if you want to see all of um, this year's entries, you can go to apta.com slash adwills. Um, in closing, I do want to thank both Stephen and Jack for allowing me this honor to present um, the awards today. And I do hope that you all do take the time to go out and really explore our city. Um, I came here and I was actually just going to stay in Atlanta for a year or two, and it's been 15 years, as my mother keeps reminding me. So hopefully you won't stay that long, but do hopefully you can get to stay a little bit longer and really just enjoy the system. And if you get a chance, um, if you are staying in one of our host hotels at Peachtree Center, if you get off the train at Five Points, just come out and go upstairs to see our soccer pitch. We're the only transit system, I believe, in the world that has a soccer pitch in our station, and it's really amazing. So hopefully you get a chance to see that. But this concludes the ceremony today. Thank you, all of you, and enjoy the rest of your time here.